Hello, and welcome back. Today we are here with the very admirable Damien Mander. Thank you for being here with us. Thanks very much for having me. So. Hit me. What do you got? You are a former Australian Navy clearance diver and a special ops sniper who served three years in Iraq. You are also the founder and CEO of the International Anti-Poaching Foundation. You are co-founder of Lead Ranger. You were featured in the Game Changers documentary and recently released documentary, Akashinga on National Geographic. What made you join the military as a Navy clearance diver and eventually becoming a sniper? Okay, yeah, so I grew up uh, east coast of Australia, uh, born in Melbourne, raised in Sydney, back to Melbourne when the parents split up. Uh, the ocean was my outlet. It's, uh, it's where I spent most of my time, either before school, after school, uh, weekends, school holidays. Mm. And I used to go, I used to go down to the pier where all the fishermen used to go. And they'd fish, fish through the night and they'd fish for calamari. And they had these little lures that they, they would use. And these things cost $15, $20 in the shops to buy. And uh, they would lose them. Uh, they would get caught on the bottom while these guys were fishing for squid or calamari. Okay. And I would go free diving down and collect these uh, these lures off snags and sell them back to the fishermen. And so I started building up like a little uh, a little empire of doing this. And you know, when you're 13, 14 years old and you're making 20 bucks a day, that's, that's not bad money. Yeah. Uh, and then I got a little bit uh, sort of creative with my, my business model and went and got a bunch of shopping carts one night and threw them in the water. And then, uh, and the, you know, this is going against the environmental damage you, you, you're speaking Yay. to now. But uh, threw them in the water and then, then stole a bunch of birthing horses, like these thick ropes of the fishing boats and wrapped them up and created like this underwater network of traps for fishing lures. And then used all the money that I made from catching ex extra lures uh, to go and buy all my scuba diving gear and, and do scuba diving courses. So, and then that just, you know, flourished into this love for diving. Wow. Yeah, so that was, uh, that's pretty much how that, and then, and then of course for any any kid growing up loving diving, the the ultimate job in the world as a diver is to be a Navy diver. So, so cool. I joined the Navy uh, as an electronics technician actually. Mm. Um, so I'd taken a job just out of school, I was working as an as a electrician and then lost that job after after getting a car loan and buying a really nice car. So okay. <laughs> the only way I could pay it was to find any job I could get and that was a garbage collector. So I was working on the back of a garbage truck. Okay. And in, in a Melbourne summer, like 110 degrees, Ooh. with all that bin juice running down your arms, mm. it's just stinking and you can't even scrub that smell out. I mean, literally the most horrible thing I've ever had to do. Oh. And then... Uh, and then um, an ad came on the radio one day saying they're taking technicians to join the uh, join the Navy. So I joined up because you couldn't join as a diver at that stage, joined up and then transferred category to become a diver. And then I uh, was happy doing that job and then September 11 happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Australian government formed what they termed the first and last resort for a terrorist attack on home soil and created a, a, a niche, a uh, very small special operations unit called Tactical Assault Group East. Yeah. And what did you do in that group? I came across a water platoon being a, being a diver, naturally, and then uh, I'd been there for a couple of days and told I was going to be a sniper. So I had to go and do uh, sniper's training, yeah. Did they just need extra snipers or did you have some sort of um, specific gift that they saw and, like, they were like, hey, we in want you? the Department you. of Gifts, I'm lacking, I promise no, you. No, you're uh, not. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what, what they were looking at uh, when they were doing the psychological testing and psychometric testing, but uh, yeah, it's not a course that you can ask to do. It's something you're told you're doing. So Really? Yeah. Is that the way it happens in the States too? I don't know, actually. Yeah. Okay. But um, yeah, I was just told. You know, and and I, I mean, I really struggled to get into this unit initially. Mm. So by the time I got on there, all I wanted to do was just you know, consolidate and, and be a part of my team. And I'd been there literally two days. And it's like you're off to go and, go and be a sniper. Wow. Yeah. And then did you, what, what did being a sniper consist of? Uh, it's like an adult's game of hide and seek, but someone gets shot at the end. <laughs> so, wow. Wow. No, that, that's, uh, that, that's the, I'm being a bit facetious. Uh, so sniping you? is- You? Facetious? Yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> so yeah, sniping is, uh, so everyone thinks it's, it's about shooting. Um, I mean, the rifles are that good, they, they shoot themselves. Your, your job is to be in the right place at the right time, have patience and discipline, uh, apply the correct marksmanship principles and and uh, basically you're sent there to, to do recon or, or uh, target acquisition and, and mm. uh, neutralization. What led you to realizing that animal conservation was and is your mission? So I'd, I'd, I'd come from, I spent three years in Iraq working over there and then I, uh, I left Iraq uh, the beginning of 2008 
uh, and went to South America. What initially was going to be a, a like some sort of a reward for having done all this stuff in the military, served in these elite units, uh, survived three years in Iraq. Mm. Uh, I'd done well financially at that stage uh, through residential property investment, I, well, well by uh, a soldier's standards, uh, maybe not uh, Hollywood standards, but... Um, and then, uh, yeah, South America just sort of was a very slippery slope. Um, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, and at the moment it seemed like fun, but then fun turned into, you know, it was... Uh, you know, out of control, literally tail spinning. And then, um, you know, this is the time when you've got mates killing themselves and mates still fighting in Iraq. And so you've gone from being part of this this unit, uh, working with these, these small niche, uh, you know, high, uh, highly capable units with a very specific mission. And then all of a sudden that stops. So you, you don't have the friends, the network anymore, or, or the mission. Mm. And then, uh, you know, it's very easy to slip back into, or slip into drugs and alcohol or, you know, I mean, the alternative is you try and get someone to come back over here and they've got to flip burgers or drive an Uber and, you know, they're actually trained to shoot someone from, from a, you know, long distance away and go into foreign countries and do whatever mission you're sent to do. And it's, right. you know, whether that's right or wrong, it's purpose. And right. Purpose one of the most elusive things. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in America here we've got 22 US veterans a day committing suicide. We're it's, a big issue. Yeah. it's a big issue. You know? yeah. So you're going to send kids away to fight the arguments of old men. We need to pick up the pieces when they come home. And uh, the, the easy outlet uh, is, is drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I ended up basically face down in, a, in, a, in cocaine and, and tequila. You know, but I, I stuck a straw up my nose rather than a, than a gun in my mouth. And, uh, yeah. you know, when I hit rock bottom, I was, I was one of the lucky ones that bounced. And a, a lot of my mates were not the same. Mm. Uh, Got involved with Andy Poaching because I heard about it as some barroom chat years before. Really? Uh, seemed like a, a, a good romantic adventure for me to go and have and uh, headed off to Africa, arrived in Africa, you know, trying to get a foot in the door, get involved with Andy Poaching units. Uh, yeah, just um, eventually, eventually got to start in Zimbabwe. Now, if I'd done any research at all, Zimbabwe probably would have been one of the last places on the planet. Uh, a white foreigner would try to set up a paramilitary training uh, um, uh, organisation, uh, you know, in a, in a country that uh, can be as, as sensitive, politically sensitive as, as what it is, what well, many countries in Africa are. And, um, you know, just eventually, you know, got this start with the unit and started working more and more with these rangers and uh, it just turned into, into something that I wanted to make last, you know, seeing seeing what rangers were doing with such minimal salaries uh, out there protecting, you know, what is essentially the heart and lungs of the planet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having come from working in Iraq where we had unlimited access to anything we needed, uh, it sort of it showed me the imbalance we have uh, and, the pro- uh, you know, our, our uh, skewed priorities. Uh, you know, I mean, in Iraq, we're looking after oil in the ground and, and dotted lines on a map, and, and these rangers were literally looking after the only one backyard we have on this planet, and that's nature. Mm-hmm. And then alongside uh, what was happening with rangers was was what was happening with animals. Uh, and there's me, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what, you know, the parallel uh, into, into American language, but, you know, I'd probably be what you'd call a redneck. Okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> hunting, guns, all that stuff. Uh, growing up, never cared about animals. For me, a, a conservationist was a hippie that had chained himself to a bulldozer or, or a tree. Uh, a vegan was just, you know, like the most extreme form of, God, I don't know what. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was almost like disgusted by it the concept of not eating meat. For many men, including myself, you know, I think this is a, a combination of ego and ignorance. Yep. Um, anyway, that aside, we'll probably get to that later. Yes, for sure. uh, yeah, just, you know, seeing animals being hunted uh, by, uh, you know, these paramilitary style units crossing international borders using uh, heavy caliber rifles, automatic weapons to, to take out, say, an elephant for its tusk or a rhino for its horn. Uh, you've got a, a rhino, a, an animal that might have 20 pounds of horn on its snout, and a, and a pound can go for 35,000 US dollars. You know, you should, these animals should be locked in a safe and they're running around areas the size of a small country. So, yeah, someone with my skills has sort of fell into step with that industry and there was, a, there was an opening there. I thought I could do things better than, than what I saw was happening in the areas I, I was working. 
and set up the International Anti Poaching Foundation. Mm. Yeah, so that was uh, October uh, 2009. Yeah. And were you just like, hey, there's a bunch of people around me, I need some help with this? Like, did you, how did you, because you have to set up a 501c3, like, did you yeah. know how to do all that or were there people no, no, helping not you? Not a chance. Uh, you know, I started with, you know, no, you know, business business school didn't function um, very well at sniper school. We didn't. Yeah, there wasn't, exactly. wasn't a whole bunch of stuff that they taught right. us there. Please tell us about what the International Anti-Poaching Foundation is, what animals do you protect, and why do people hunt these animals? Yeah, so, so uh, initially when we started as an organisation, we are being a service provider. It was me going out and doing training with other rangers uh, in other organisations. And then we scaled up, we started getting more trainers involved. Uh, and, and spreading our, our, our work uh, across Zimbabwe and then across the region. Uh, still focusing as being, you essentially think of us as a not-for-profit uh, security company. Mm. Um, we, and we were species focused. So looking after elephant and rhino, because these were the animals that were being hunted in the most aggressive tactics. And it made sense for someone like me with the background I have to be able to go out and provide those skills and that training. Over time, we evolved to take on much bigger projects and, and instead of just looking at the training of rangers or the security, but to be able to take over the management of, of whole areas. And, and then eventually that led us to stop looking at uh, being a service provider and we started buying our own land. We started buying our own leases on land mm -hmm. uh, and, and as parks. And at the same time, we, we, we started doing that and stopped being a service provider. We we also stopped looking at species and started looking at biodiversity. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, our future as a civilization is dependent on our willingness to preserve biodiversity. And I don't think there's ever been a, a, a greater example in the history of our civilization than at the moment, when yeah. we as a global community are brought to our knees as a direct result of, of the way that we treat nature. And so that, 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 that expansion for us to take on biodiversity as opposed to species was, was an important step with the realisation and the knowledge that if you protect uh, all biodiversity, then the elephants and the rhinos, all the sexy animals uh, uh, are looked after, but so is that rich tapestry of life that, mm. that we depend on. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time we, start, we started doing that, we stopped looking at parks in, 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 in isolation. We started looking at landscapes, these, these massive network of parks that stitch together, that, that, that create these large scale landscapes. And that's essentially where we are today. So. And so what if some of the animals roam outside of the area that you protect? Yeah, so they, uh, so we have an influence over the entire landscape, even though we're not in the entire landscape. We have mm. a very good intelligence network. We work very good with our, our partners that surround the areas that we do have the, the land leases on. Uh, we have a very good relationships in the community. So if an animal wanders out into the community and uh, you see, you get an elephant that comes and raids a, a, a corn or a maize crop, uh, you know, that can, you know, that can destroy the livelihood of an entire village over in, in one night. So we, we have our scouts, our unarmed rangers that work in the communities mm -hmm. and their job is to deal with what's called human-wildlife conflict. Okay. Uh, and that is you might have a, a, a lion wandering out and killing cows or goats and all these things are the dynamics that we have to play with on a daily basis when you have human populations living alongside wild populations and that it takes up a large portion of, of our time and resources. Have you seen numbers improve since you've been protecting nature? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in uh, in Mozambique, when we we're working along the Kruger National Park border, we were able to drive a 95% downturn in rhino po poaching in the area that we were not only patrolling, but also influencing uh, directly to our west in Kruger National Park. That section of Kruger uh, and the southern third of Kruger, which was accounting for about 70% of rhinos that were being killed on the planet each year. That was part of a, a, a cross-border uh, multi-agency uh, operation uh, where we, we were stationed in Mozambique uh, and basically the organisation separating the largest population and concentration of rhino on the planet from where most of the syndicates, uh, illegal wildlife crime syndicates were operating from to come through the area that we were patrolling to come in and hunt rhino. Uh, where we are in the, the, the mid to lower Zambezi Valley at the moment where we started Akashinga and I'm sure we'll get onto that program yes, later. Yes. Uh, that uh, between 2001 and 2016, there was uh, uh, around 8,000 elephants killed uh, in that region or, or about 40% um, about of the overall population there. Since we've started Akashinga, uh, we've helped and play a part in driving an 80% downturn uh, in elephant poaching in that area. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's cool, hey? Elephants are keystone species too, so it represents what is happening with a lot of other species in the area. Huh. Uh, and we've been able to measure in the areas that we patrol, not regionally, uh, a 399% increase in wildlife populations overall. 
That's yeah. amazing. That's cool. Yeah, I'm proud of it. Cheers. What are some alternatives to trophy hunting so people understand that they have options and don't need to harm others, whether it be for a living or for sport? Yeah, I can talk to the trophy hunting thing pretty well because I used to be that person. Yeah. And I tell you, so I, I, I was never allowed to touch guns growing up. Okay. okay. So then I turn 18 and the first thing you do as a kid that's not allowed to touch guns is gun by gun. Yes, exactly. And then, uh, you know, I, I don't know for what reason exactly. You know, I, I actually I remember I got asked this question doing, a, doing an interview for a Czech fashion magazine of all things. Okay. And it was... Uh, you know, why did you grow up to be like this macho dude, like this, yes. you know, this alpha? Yes. And, uh, and I actually I'd never really thought too much about it. And then uh, when my parents, you know, it was during this interview and these, this, this is like being on the couch for me. This is like therapy doing these these podcasts and stuff. Yes, I yes. get to answer all these questions. Yes. But uh, so I was during this interview and, and I said, okay, well, yeah, I remember being, um, my parents separated. I went to a new school. I think I was like five or six or something like that. And I used to get the shit beaten out of me every single day. And, uh, you know, I remember going home every day with all the buttons ripped off your shirt and black eyes and scratches and that. But, you know, you'd, you'd eventually start fighting back. And, right. And then uh, I just remember growing up, I never wanted to be in that position again. And so you sort of take on this uh, this tougher persona and then, of course, you take on a tougher persona, you've got to live up to it. Right. And that's um, – so, so I sort of was being forced and forced myself into this 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 mould. And then growing up, uh, teenage years and then, and then, you know, heading towards the military and all that, there's, you know, there's, there's this, this prophecy to fulfil. And hunting became a desperate form of – of, of me trying to get some sort of primal respect from my peers. And it was, that's all it was. And to do, to get that respect or what I thought was respect, I took aim at the vulnerable. And, uh, you know, it's looking back on it now and I can look back on it now and I can talk to the person I used to be because I've come 180 degrees. And so I don't think there's a, there's a great deal of people that can, that, that can come into that demographic and say, hey, guys, I used to be here. I understand what's going on. Right. Like this, is a, this, is a, this is an insecurity issue largely. Um, and it's an ego issue. And I know that because I can put my hand on my heart and say that's why I used to do it. It wasn't about the hunt or the meat or anything like that. It was about me trying to prove something. And you know, to fast forward, I never hunted after Iraq because I knew what it was like to be hunted. Uh, and if people really want to do, do a hunt, then, then guys can sign up for the Army or Marines or something. Uh, yeah, like taking, taking aim at, at the vulnerable and like to say it's some sort of prehistoric thing that we're trying to fulfill or, you know, we don't live in 1652 anymore where we have to go right. out and buddy. Right, right. Uh, you know, we're not in the Stone Ages. Right. You know, we have supermarkets, we have gardens, we've got ways that we can get food without having to go out and hunt. In terms of hunting now, you know, if, to fast forward where we are as an organisation and, and look at Africa and conservation uh, and where hunting fits into that, uh, hunting is a dying industry. You've got, um, there's about twice as much land set aside in Africa, which is held on the communal land trust. So these are indigenous communities that own last, large tracts of, uh, of wilderness. Uh, it's about twice as much of that land as there is national parks. Okay, so a lot of these areas have used hunting as a economic model to try and put money back into the communities uh, on whatever scale. Sometimes it's been success successful, sometimes it hasn't. Okay, now people will say, you know, hunting sucks, hunting, you've got to stop hunting, all that, okay, whatever that may be. I'll tell you what I hate more than hunting. I hate the fact that us as an international community haven't come up with a different economic model to support conservation in so many areas as what hunting does. Okay, so for all the vegans, self-included, animal rights people, conservationists, all that out there that say I hate, hate hunting, okay, you, you're going to hate the alternative more. And the alternative is you just say, get rid of hunting, hunting stops, and then overnight there's nothing there. So hunting is supplying resources in some areas, uh, and that's that's the ugly truth. And if people want to stop that, you can't just say, I want to stop hunting. You've got to say, I want to stop hunting, and we have a different solution for these areas, right. like, which we have been implementing. But hunting is dying for three reasons. One, you've got reduced wildlife populations, less product to sell. 
Uh, you've got less customers uh, because you've got a generation raised on social media that doesn't want to get on a plane anymore and fly across the world so they can shoot something and hang it above the fire. Right. Uh, and then you've got shifting policies and regulations around the exportation of certain trophies, like elephant ivory from Zimbabwe to a place like America, which made up 52% of the clientele. So you've got, you've got uh, less clients, uh, it's less clients, less product to sell, and tougher regulations to connect those two. Uh, the, the, the fallout of that is so many areas that were previously set aside for hunting no longer have that economic income and communities are looking for different ways to either motivate conservation, which they're struggling to do, uh, or they'll, they'll find different land uses. Uh, and those land uses uh, would be agriculture or human settlement. Once you lose a piece of land, a piece of wilderness, uh, the, the, the trees get cut down, the animals get poached, uh, it's turned over to agriculture, it's turned over to human settlement, that piece is lost. Mm. Okay, and so we, we, we're now sitting at a time in, in 2021 where the science tells us for us to stop our acceleration into the sixth mass great extinction, we need to hold on to as much of uh, Earth for nature as possible. 50% is where the mark is at. Half of this planet needs to be set aside for nature. The greatest self-regulating system we have on this planet, a system that's been working for five billion years. Uh, we're trying to come up with all this other tech stuff and, and do this, do that. How are we going to stop climate change, global warming, all that? Just protect nature and nature will do its thing. We've got to stop t t t uh, treating the world like a toilet at the same time yeah. as well. Uh, so we, we, we're currently sitting at about 17% of the planet that's being protected. So what we can't do is, what we can't afford to do is lose what we have. So we need to hold on to what we have and keep gaining ground. And that's why finding an alternate use for hunting uh, is going to be so critical in the, the conservation and environmental movement going forward in coming years. Uh, and I can get into the economics of our model and, and how that works after when we get into to Akashinga. But yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, you know, we're essentially, we have a different economic model for trophy hunting areas, which is working. You have learned to understand the strengths of women, which are many, and you've honed in on using them to help others. Out of a 240 person crew, 150 of them are women. Please tell us about Akashinga and what made you want to train an all female force. Yeah, okay. Uh, so to, to do that, I'll give you some context about my background. Uh, you know, I, I built a, a career across three continents in training men for frontline deployment. Never worked with women, had never wanted to work with women. Uh, worked in exclusively all male units, uh, special operations being the ultimate sort of boys club. Uh, you know, you can pay yourself, you pay your way for memberships into all these clubs around the world, but you can't pay your way into special operations. You know, that mm. stuff is earned and earned the hard way. And uh, we, you know, I remember uh, in particular, a university study done on our unit trying to integrate women into into the ranks, and we all took like a locker room vote, saying, "No, we don't. We we rather make try and make our entrance standards harder than work alongside women." We as an industry are stagnating when other industries are getting ahead by getting more women on the boards, more women in, as CEOs, and more women into management. And uh, so we, I mean, as conservationists, if we were getting it right in, uh, overall in the industry, the situation with wildlife would be much better. Mm. So we need to look at different models uh, and look at what other industries are doing, otherwise we're going to get left behind. Uh, we, um, I was actually in New York, over here in the States, in New York, reading an article in the, the uh, New York Times, and it was about... Uh, the US Army Rangers training women to go through their training and in preparation for frontline deployment. Hmm. So I was like, okay, well, the US military is doing this. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that's, it's different. You know, it's not just training women for some basic role. There's a the US Army Rangers. Yeah. And, and the significant part about that, that, that unit was a decade before reading that article in Northern Baghdad, our, our convoy got blown up, a few people at the checkpoint killed. We were surrounded and basically, uh, Long story short, we, we, the US Army Rangers came in there and got us out alive. And uh, reading this article, I'm thinking, well, if the unit that was good and gracious enough to save my life back there in Northern Baghdad that day uh, is now training women for, for frontline army roles, then maybe we should really start looking at integrating women into frontline conservation roles and proper ones, not stuck on a desk or stuck walking a fence right. line uh, or, or given a uniform and a weapon and get some pictures taken for social media, but genuine integration of women thrust into the forefront of, of law enforcement and conservation. And uh, that, that was the beginning of us uh, having to have this internal process, one, as a board, uh, to decide. And I tell you now, like when it came to, down to voting on the board of directors, you know, it was, you know, it was something we had to push. 
I mean, we were, we, we'd been beating the, this militarization of conservation drum very loudly over the previous decade as an organization. Uh, we were male led, uh, both in management and, and in the field. And now we're proposing to do something which, you know, for many would appear to be a little bit gimmicky uh, and to bring in a group of women uh, to, to do what is uh, not only uh, uh, institutionally within conservation reserved for men, but also in, in rural African society. It's, it's a man's job. And not only is it a man's job uh, in the eyes of most, but any job that's available first would be offered to, to men uh, as opposed to women. Hmm. And uh, so we had to go and uh, first get our own, our own uh, uh, house in order and get the approvals and the funding raised to go and do this trial program, then go and speak to the local chief uh, and local government and get their approvals uh, to train women, uh, to, or to, not even to train, just to trial. You know, we, we had to start a trial that everyone thought these women were going to fail uh, and then you know, basically prove that this is, a, this is a flawed concept and go back to training men. The chief uh, agreed to a three-day trial uh, to, with the women for us to, to select wow. women from the community and do a three-day trial, and that was to demonstrate that this is a this is not going to work and we're wasting everyone's time. And uh, that three-day trial is now going. We're about um, four years into it now. Nice. Yeah. I have a note written that most of them, if not all, are survivors of serious sexual assault and domestic violence, single mothers and abandoned wives. When I first arrived in, in Zimbabwe, it had the lowest life expectancy in the world for a woman, and that was 36 years of age uh, back in 2009. So that's um, so when we st were starting this program and we're speaking with the chiefs and the traditional elders, uh, we're like, okay, if if we're going to start a program that maybe goes longer than three days, let's give an opportunity to the people that need it the most. And that's why we, we set the criteria for exactly what you said. Uh, uh, you know, these women came in, 87 women initially uh, from the local communities came down to go through what we call pre-selection interviews. And that's where we listen to the stories. Um, those stories are verified by the people uh, that come in from the village, the elders that sit there with them, uh, that have nominated them for these roles. And listening to those stories was bloody tough. As an organization taking away money from organized crime, what safety measures are implemented to protect you and your team from retaliation? I've got the, the hammer twins. Sledge and Jack. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> them. <laughs> um, no, I shouldn't joke about that. Um, there are people in our industry um, that have been assassinated, um, people that run organisations similar to ours. Uh, we are dealing with organised crime. We are taking money uh, and another currency, uh, which is animal parts out of organised crime. Uh, recently, one of our uh, undercover investigators uh, it was an attempted assassination attempt on, on, on his life, um, tied up in his car, doused in petrol, set on fire. Um, he's just been released from intensive care after almost two months um, in the high dependency unit of, of intensive care. Um, and a big thank you to all the donors out there that helped us with all those medical costs and, and rehabilitation costs. But um, yeah, it's tough. Uh, you know, we, we believe in, in what we do just it's like people around the world that are working in conservation and, and environmental work, animal rights. Uh, you know, we, we are constantly seen to be, to be not only fighting uh, for our cause, but fighting the system uh, and fighting the enemies that are out there. Uh, you know, also to you know, throw gen environmental journalists in, into that mix. You know, just, it's a dangerous job, but, you know, we, we do what we do uh, knowing that um, you know, the situation would be much worse if we weren't all, all, all committed to this. Um, but also, you know, at some point, our organisation would have been described as a bus crash organisation. If Damien gets hit, hit by a bus, it's, you know, what's going to happen next? Uh, but we've now got, a, you know, a very robust organisation with um, you know, multi-tiered management systems uh, right. to a point where, you know, if I did get hit by a bus, touch wood, that doesn't happen, uh, the organisation will continue. Well, eventually, you know, you're you're going to leave this behind as a legacy. You know, none of us, you're going to get old and eventually pass away too. So there needs to be some sort of system set in place so this can mm -hmm. outlast you. Yeah, know, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, we, we created something here. So yeah. it's, and it's moving, it's going, it's, it's expanding. Uh, we've got amazing, uh, not only team of people on the ground and, and supporting us, uh, logistics network around the world, but donors, uh, 
media um, influences or yeah, it, it really is. It's a whole machine, uh, and I'm just on one cog in that machine. You say the simplest way to defend animals is to not eat them. When did you go vegan, and what was it that sparked this change? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I suppose like like many people, you can create. Um, whatever sort of narrative in your own mind to suit your conveniences. And uh, when I'd been working with conservation and working with animals for some years, uh, over those years, the, the, the good Damien kept saying to the bad Damien, you know, you gotta stop eating, uh, you gotta stop eating meat because this is bull You know, you're, you're involved with conservation. The biggest threat we have to to uh, the natural world is the meat industry in regards to land degradation. The biggest cause of animal suffering and death on this planet is the meat industry. And here's me getting up on stage, asking people to donate money to our cause so we can protect the environment and animals. And I was full in doing that. And, uh, you know, I come from military units where the, the, the leaders are real, they're real leaders, they're true leaders. They're the sort of people that when they say we're going over there and through that door or over that ridge, you don't even ask questions, you go, you're straight behind them. And that's the sort of leader I wanted to be. I wanted to lead by example in, in the organisation I, I ran. And I wasn't, I didn't want to ask people to do anything that I wasn't prepared to do myself. Uh, and that involved uh, compassion to animals. And uh, yeah, it was, it was just the accumulation of the truth uh, over time. Uh, you know, kept suppressing it, kept suppressing it. And then I was asked to do a talk at uh, the Sydney Opera House for TEDx. Um, hadn't done much public speaking before. It was great. Uh, thank Remember you. Check it out. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I hadn't done much public speaking before. And the next thing I'm on stage in front of uh, two and a half thousand people. Were you nervous? Um, I was in, uh, by then I was in the zone. Hey, I had a message yeah. to, to say and I right. wanted to get there and say it. Yeah. But in the preparation for this talk, uh, and I've been asked to talk about conservation and our work, and in the preparation for that talk, I stumbled just down the rabbit hole of really getting getting to understand the science behind the meat industry and and how that um, is 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 reflected in conservation and how we as an organisation could take a lead in in the industry because there's not many conservationists that actually follow this this path and and. You know, I often say at conferences, and it, like we've lost money. We've lost money from donors who say, no, I don't respect or I don't like the way Damien's talking about the industry or the people involved with it. And uh, But I say, I'll, I'll keep saying it. I don't care if it costs cost us money because the truth's not for sale. But uh, there's two types of conservationists. The tr the, 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 there's two types of conservationists. There's, there's, there's vegans and there's those that don't want to take their work home. And uh, you know, that may be a thing for people to hear, but... You know, essentially, if, if you're part of a system that is is responsible for the degradation of exactly what it is we're trying to save, and those who are we trying to uh, trying to protect, then you know, it's 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 we're being hypocritical. Uh, and then you know, me me, you know, I'll say it again, I'm an alpha. You know, whether you, whether I like that or not, people want to accept that. Uh, and I don't want to pay something, someone to do something to an animal that I'm not prepared to do myself. Mm. Uh, you know, us as, as supposedly the strong uh, or leaders in society should be protecting and leading by example, and that's uh, the person I want to be. I'm glad you are. Your whole team is vegan as well, right? Yeah, so we have, uh, so we have, we've got about 240 people uh, on staff in Zimbabwe as part of Akashinga, about a, so basically all the law enforcement roles uh, are women. Uh, we have a number of uh, roles in the community, construction, labor, uh, that we employ men, so we have some balance there. Mm -hmm. But uh, when people are at work uh, for yeah, up to 21 days at a time, we're preparing all the meals. We only serve plant-based food. We have seven vegan chefs there, uh, led by um, the amazing Chef Cola. She's sort of a, a rising rock star in the, in the, the vegan culinary world. Just had a great uh, write-up in Forbes magazine, actually. Good for her. Um, so yeah, so but so when people are, are at work, they that's all we serve. When they go home, they can do whatever they want. But most, from what we understand, from sort of independent surveys, uh, most of them are maintaining this back in the home. We have a program called uh, Back to Black Roots. Mm -hmm. So you look in a lot of African countries, getting access to healthcare in rural areas is very tough. So for us, uh, one of the 
uh, best preventative measures that we, we can implement is, is good and healthy diets, nutritionist, uh, nutritional diets. Mm. So we teach people how to grow their own food, how to prepare their own food, how to speak about it from an environmental, ethical and nutritional standpoint. Uh, that's our staff. Second stage is families. Uh, stage three is communities. And stage four is building ambassadors. So, and uh, all that aside, you know, for everyone that says, oh, I can't go vegan or it's too hard, it's too tough, when you, you're sitting there and and Whole Foods trying to decide which one of 17,000 cheeses you're going to take home, vegan cheeses or sausages or that. We don't have any of that in Zimbabwe. We don't have all that stuff. And yet here you have a group of women in one of the most remote, and wild and hostile locations on the continent in the world doing one of the most toughest and respected jobs and they're doing it on a plant-based diet. That's amazing. Boom. When you're out all day defending the innocent and fighting off the bad guys, do you feel eating a plant-based diet improves your strength, mental clarity, and endurance? Uh, so, I mean, just from, I mean, let's deal with the conscious aspect first. I mean, sure. getting, getting out of bed in the morning, knowing that you're not part of that system is the most refreshing thing I've ever had in my life. Uh, and literally, I will say, out of everything I've done, the places I've been, the people I've met, uh, the goals I've hit, uh, going vegan is all of that combined and sitting at the top. And it's, it really is the best thing I've ever done in my life or with my life because it opens up a completely different lens to how you see the world, perceive others, and the empathy you can show. And, and, and all that feeds into the work you do and the decisions that you make. And that for me has been like it just a, and it's not even a redemption thing trying to make up for the past. It's, it's not, okay, we can learn from the past, but it's looking forward and knowing that this is, this is who I want to be going forward and it's being honest, it's being true to myself. Uh, from a health and, and, and uh, aspect, uh, you know, I never actually, I, I'm, I'm a vegan for ethical reasons. Um, I enjoy coming here and I enjoy eating the, eating the bad stuff and then soy nuggets and the deep fried <laughs> stuff and this and that and having sauce and crumbs <laughs> dribble down my chest and uh, watching Netflix, you know, I enjoy that and I, I appreciate it. You know why? Because I don't get that shit over there. So when I come here, I want to make sell America really well. <laughs> watching like... Netflix with crumbs on the chest. Yeah. I'm... Okay. <laughs> but you, but you... <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I, I'm doing it for I'm doing it for the animals. I'm doing yes. it for the environment. I'm not doing it for the health reasons. Although you know, I still try and eat reasonably healthy. But I have mm. my little, uh, yeah, little. Yeah. little mishaps here and there, but, uh, you know, we all do. And that's, you know, sometimes I also think that can be some of our, uh, the biggest um, hindrance we have to our movement is, 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 and I'm not talking about mishaps of eating bad food, I'm talking about mishaps of, you know, people trying to go vegan and they, you know, they, oh, I had some cheese here, or I had some, some free range eggs here. Uh, and people are like, ah, 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 you can't do it, you can't do it. It's like, it's not about, it's not about making mistakes. We all make mistakes, yeah. regardless of if it's our diet, if it's our work life, if it's our, our love life, relationships. We all make mistakes. You know why? Because we're human beings. Right. It's about fixing the mistake and moving forward, not getting stuck on it and going, you know what, this is too hard. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, people just need to relax a little bit in our movement because uh, we can be our own worst enemies. Yeah. Uh, even people that, that decide that they're, they're, they're just going to reduce the amount of meat or the amount of dairy that they're, they're taking in, of course, you know, I don't want to eat something that, that, you know, comes from, you know, that suffering or from that industry, but other people still will. And if they just realize you don't need to eat meat three times a day, seven days a week and just cut it down you know, a bunch, we're still going to be making a lot more impact than if we all just go, you know what, this whole vegan plant-based thing just looks too hard. I'm not going to sign up for it at all. So yeah, let's keep an open mind. And, and you know, we're not all, we're not all perfect. You know, it's, it's no, no one's perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Around 20 veterans die every day from suicide, dealing with trauma from war. What resources or even practices would you recommend to those who are struggling with PTSD or regaining and finding purpose? Yeah, um, you know, I'll, I'll say I, I was one of the lucky ones that found purpose uh, afterwards and it's, it's not all that easy, hey? For some reason, I always knew I'd find it traveling out there in the world. Mm. Um, yeah, that there are networks of, of, of organisations out there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating. You used to get frustrated, really, really um, upset when someone in our unit would kill themselves. And then uh, I remember our commanding officer getting up one day and explaining to us, and he said in the, in the mind of that person, they think that they're doing everyone else a favour and that's mm. the best option. Uh, that, that's almost like a selfless act uh, for them to take themselves out of the equation and let everyone carry on with their life. And, that, and when you look at that from a... From a uh, 
a different perspective. You're like, no, you know, it really does damage people and, and you know, particularly when you leave kids behind, family behind and and people wondering and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you got to you know, just, just don't do anything stupid. Just relax and, and take your time because uh, we all go through situations. We all do. It's, I mean, it's not no normal to say, oh, I just want to be happy all the time. You know, being depressed, being down, being upset, being angry, being anxious. These are all parts of life that we experience, you know, and it, it's a resilience of getting through the tough times that, that forge the sort of characters that we become. And, uh, you know, you just, you just got to hang in there, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's trying to get through a tough time in your life or trying to get through a tough selection program or get into a, into a, a unit, whatever it may be, or a job, uh, perseverance and just, uh, you know, a bit of stubbornness, just sticking it out. It, you, I mean, it overcomes most things. And the units I get in, got into in the military, they weren't, you know, there's nothing special about me other than when everyone else said it's too hard or it couldn't be done. I'm like, no, f this, it can be done and I'm not going anywhere. And uh, it's the same with life, I eh? just, just stick it out because, uh, you know, I've been through, uh, a lot of people have been through. And you look back on those times and you go, yeah, when you get through it, it's like the next time you're going through it, it doesn't, the same, it doesn't seem like anything. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, it's fine. I've dealt with that before. And you're a stronger person. You're better prepared for the world because of it. Uh, you know, drugs and alcohol too can be, uh, you know, if people are out there and they're, they're going through a time and they're, they're relying on drugs and alcohol, then, you know, find, getting help to be able to cut that stuff out of your, out of your life is, is a huge step in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately for those that have... Uh, that have taken that as, a, as an option and, and, you know, having been someone who's gone through this, you know, a couple of times in my life, it's no, it's either, it's either all on or it's all off. It's very hard to find in between for someone that's using that as a, as a, as an outlet. Uh, you can't, you can't just go from being all on and, and, and using that as a, as a constant coping mechanism to just using it as a coping mechanism sometimes because it recedes back into what it was. Of course. And, uh, but the, the, there is help out there and, and I suppose one of the biggest, mistakes we can make is to think that this is something we have to deal with by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, I often think uh, veteran affairs and and and, uh, and the systems that are set up by the military are often systems that are designed to make you fail uh, in, in many countries. Uh, and it's almost like an insurance company trying to get a claim and you just, they just keep pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down. You know, don't, don't, don't always put all your eggs in one basket relying on those guys. You know, look at other avenues out there. Yeah. Um, but it's there, there. There is a way. There's a way through pretty much everything in this life. Hey, eh? there is. You just got to hang in there. There's, you know, it may not seem like it, but there's people out there that love you and care about you, and and people that will miss you. And yeah. uh, you just, just hang in there, guys. Mm -hmm. Hang in there. Did adopting a plant-based diet help you with PTSD in any way, or even help with the bigger picture of realizing your mission and purpose in life? Yeah, I suppose. You know, PTSD is a. Uh, it's not. It's not always wrapped up into one situation. It can be it can be wrapped up into a whole bunch of things woven together. And I suppose being a part of, I mean, the biggest thing for me to deal with in in Iraq was being a part of a system that that obliterated a a country and a culture and destabilized a region. Uh, you know, for you know, for profit. Uh, you know, I, I can't go back and change that, but I can do something positive uh, about my own self evolution and about how I want to once spend the money that I made from, from my time in Iraq, which I put a hundred percent of that into, into starting the, the organization, mm -hmm. but to my actions, uh, the actions that I take going forward, the skills that I got, the experience that I had and channeling that into something positive. Uh, and I suppose the positive nar narrative of my evolution, the plant-based vegan side, it, it feeds largely into that. And, and I suppose, Choosing to lead the life that you dream of living, uh, of living, mm -hmm. um, is is probably one of the best uh, antidotes for for PTSD. You know, finding purpose and, and finding something you're passionate about, and, and living it, chasing your dreams. You're not getting stuck down and bogged down in the system and thinking that you know this is it. It's the daily grind, and you're just going to do this Groundhog Day for the rest of your life. Uh, but going out there and realizing there's a, there's a life to be lived and a, and a world to be seen and um, you know, the, I mean, the plant-based side is just, is, it's a very important and central component of, of who I am, uh, but it's not everything. Right, for sure, for sure. Mm.
Okay, so how can people help support your work in the International Anti-Poaching Foundation? Uh, yeah, so we're a 501c3 uh, nonprofit here in, in the US, uh, raising money for expansion as an organization. We, we have 240 staff as part of Akashinga. Um, we're scaling. Uh, we started with one reserve with 16 women, 240 now and eight, eight reserves. Uh, and we're scaling towards uh, 20 reserves or reclaimed uh, areas that would otherwise be lost uh, by 2026. Uh, wow. Uh, with a staff of, of a thousand. And uh, so we're also in the process of replicating this model in, in another country, uh, which will also take us into coastal and maritime conservation. So, you know, we we hope hoping to raise uh, towards another $5 million per annum uh, over the next couple of years nice. uh, to, to help with that scaling. So, but any, any it, it all adds up, yes. uh, you know, whether it's $5 a month or $10 a month or, you know, this trip so far has been been amazing for us from a fundraising standpoint. Nice. Uh, so it's it's really good. It's really positive to see people acknowledging what we're doing as a different form of conservation. Uh, you know, we we essentially started a trial in a small landlocked country in sub-Saharan Africa in a conservation industry that's becoming increasingly antagonistic with local indigenous communities on a continent that's had a 700% increase in armed conflict in the last decade. All we did was shift male roles to construction and labour and we put women into the, the power roles of law enforcement, decision making and management. In doing that, we, we completely de-escalated uh, attention with local indigenous communities. We brought conservation and communities together and we cut our core operating costs by two thirds through demilitarisation. So we're not using helicopters and big offences and more gun uh, biceps and bullets type mindset. Uh, I like that name. That should be that should be a name for a business. What biceps and bullets? Yeah, who? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, the, look, the remaining third that we're spending uh, is invested largely into women, uh, which is the most effective form of community development funding, and that's what we did. We put women as the centre of our conservation strategy. It gives us the greatest traction in uh, in community development, and conservation became the byproduct. The money that we save through demilitarisation and not having to pay for helicopters and all that other stuff, we, we spend in, in healthcare, uh, education. We've got 120 school aged children going through um, uh, scholarships at the moment. Um, infrastructure such as roads, um, town halls, schools, um, and then water sanitation. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a whole community driven uh, program. Um, now, that has, has resulted in an 80% reduction in, in elephant poaching. Um, we've seen a 60% 60 60 reduction in rape and serious sexual assaults in these communities. Um, most of our women within 18 months um, of joining the program have bought their own land and built their own house. For many of them, that means getting their communities together. Wow. Um, we have an alternate economic income um, uh, for communities that used to use hunting as, as a model that no longer have to use, use hunting uh, to protect these areas. All our areas are non-consumptive, I mean, we don't do any form of hunting in them. Uh, and we, we're expanding this program and this model across the continent. Other organisations are adopting it. Uh, and it's it's a way to, to completely de-escalate um, conflict. It puts women to the forefront of, of law enforcement and conservation, which shifts the dynamics of society for the better. Now we have women from the communities that they were raised in, that their parents were raised in, that they're raising their own children in. Their children are going to school in these communities. They, they have a long-term vested interest in the, these places. And uh, we have something much more powerful than than, than the seek and destroy yeah. uh, ideology. We have these interpersonal relationships that are driven at household level in these communities. And that when you're trying to work with tens of thousands of people that live alongside an area the size of a small country that you're trying to protect with minimal resources, the best weapon you can have is those relationships. And then they also take the money that they make the knowledge that they gain, and then they put it back into the community. Yeah, so a woman, home. Yeah, a woman on average in, in rural Africa will spend between 80 and 90 percent of a salary on family and local community. A male will spend about 30 to 40 percent. Hmm. Well, my friend, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do for the animals, for mm. people, for so many. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are truly a hero. Thanks, mate. Well, yeah. you are giving. Uh, our movement of voice. So thank you. Yes. Yes. Cheers, mate. Well <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. Love Gianna and Damien Manda. <laughs>